Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a scientific content specialist at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installments in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series entitled Organoid Growth Media, Techniques to Help You Streamline Culture, presented by Mr. Steve Budd. Dr. James Clinton and Mr. Stefan Friend appear in the tutorial segment of this presentation. Dr. Clinton then joins us as a panelist during the Q&A session. Mr. Budd is a product specialist at ATCC, while Dr. Clinton is a lead scientist. In this presentation, Mr. Budd will give some background on the Human Cancer Models Initiative describing organoids and other advanced models. Then, Dr. Clinton will provide instruction on how to produce growth media using ATCC organoid growth kits while Mr. Friend demonstrates. After he closes, Mr. Budd and Dr. Clinton will join us for a lively Q&A session that addresses your most technical challenges in organoid growth. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. So with that, I'd like to welcome Steve Budd. Thanks for the introduction, Brian. Founded in 1925, ATCC is a nonprofit organization with headquarters in Manassas, Virginia, and an R&D and service center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. We're an innovative R&D company featuring gene editing, differentiated stem cells, and advanced models such as organoids, which is the topic of today's presentation. During this presentation, we will give an overview of the Human Cancer Model Initiative and give descriptions of the models we offer. We'll also show what support is offered for these models in the way of clinical and genomic information, as well as organoid culture support. This will include our new organoid growth kits designed to simplify the complete organoid growth medium workflow. We're also going to play a video demonstrating the media preparation using these kits. There is an unmet need for better preclinical cancer models. Why are existing cell lines used for preclinical studies insufficient? Many models are available in the way of classical cell lines but are lacking specific tissue such as liver and pancreas where, th where these models are underrepresented in research and clinical studies. Many cells lack historical data, both in the way of patient demographics and clinical, clinical outcome. Also, many cell lines have been in culture for so long, it can be hard to determine how representative they are to the original models. Current cell line models consisting of single cells do not imitate the complexity of cancer diseases. They like the genetic diversity and different cell types that exist in real cancer tumors. In short, cancer cell lines are not true biological representatives of tumors. They like biological relevance. More advanced models such as patient-derived organoids can help address these deficiencies. As an overview of the HCMI program, the key players are divided between the founders, model developers, and distributor. The founders who fund the program include the National Cancer Institute, Cancer Research UK, the Hubert Organoid Technology Foundation, and the Welcome Sanger Institute. The model developers are the ones that generate the models from the patient-derived biopsies and consists of the Broad Institute, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, Welcome Sanger Institute, the Hubert Organoid Technology Foundation, University of Verona, Hubert Institute, Stanford University, and World Cornell Medical College. The models are then sent to ACC, ATCC for final distribution. ATCC is currently the sole distributor of the HCMI models. This is a workflow that describes how the models are generated and distributed in more detail. The model developers work with clinical sites where biopsies and clinical data is taken. Biopsies will be sent for both sequencing and to the model developers for generation of the in vitro models. The models themselves will be sent to ATCC for expansion, quality control testing, and distribution. A subset of models that have been expanded 
at ATCC will then be sent back for resequencing. ATCC will continue to expand quality control test models before distribution to the biomedical community. One important aspect of the uniqueness of, the mo of these models is the level of characterization that they undergo. This includes molecular and clinical data. The desire is to make available whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing. As previously stated, this sequencing is done on the original biopsies. A significant amount of patient data is also collected, which includes the diagnosis, patient background demographics, and the treatment the patients received, as well as the resulted outcome. A little later on the presentation, I will show you where this data can be accessed. The HMI models consist of different technologies. This presentation is going to focus on organoids and organoid culture techniques. But in addition, we do have various other model types, such as large assortments of neurospheres, which are 3D spheroid glioblastoma models, and other more standard 2D models that may represent more rare cancer types. So specifically, what is an HCMI organoid? You need to note that organoids can be made in various ways, such as through normal primary tissue or through iPSCs. Organoids in general are self-organizing micro tissues that grow in a 3D extracellular matrix. But these HDMI models are unique. As I previously mentioned, they're all patient derived from biopsy tissue. They consist of multiple cell types and exhibit cellular polarization. This allows for in vivo architectural features. As an example, in this image, you can see the lumen form, which is a common feature for these organoid models. Similar to classical cell lines, they exhibit long-term expansion. They can undergo multiple passages while being shown to be phenotypically and genetically stable. So here I'm going to touch on the organoid culture technology. The technology originally came from Hans Cleaver's lab at the Uric Institute in the Netherlands. As it applies to human organoids, it relies on advanced medium that can include conditioned media from wit and our spine and cell lines, recombinant proteins, and small molecules. This diagram is an overview of the culture process. To begin, suspended cells and fragments are dropped into the extracellular matrix. They're incubated at 37 degrees, where the matrix polymerizes into a gel forming a dome structure. Liquid media is then overlaid on the dome, the cell structures then develop and enlarge into these complete organoids. The bright field image on the right is an example of a real model so you can see what they actually look like. In this image, you can see the lumen, which gives this organoid a balloon-like appearance. To passage the models, the organoids in ECM is collected. The ECM is removed and organoids are enzymatically disassociated. At this point, they can be replated and expanded again. For the next few slides, I'll focus on the resources available to access supporting information, such as the clinical and sequencing data, as well as information and support ATCC offers. Here we have the HMI searchable catalog managed by NCI. It integrates some clinical information and allows you to search from the model based on characteristics of your choice. You can search for the models of interest based on a number of filters, such as primary tumor site, model type, diagnosis, stage, grade, histological type, as well as gender, age, and ethnicity. One thing to emphasize is that this link directly to the ATCC product page where the models can be purchased. So if you go to this catalog and narrow your search until you find the model you want, you can be directed to its location on ATCC's website for purchase. The Genomic Data is Common, or GDC, is another NCI-managed site for a number of cancer data sets. One thing to note is this is not HCMI-specific. To find HCMI models, search for the HCMI CMDC project to find the list of models from the HCMI. Here you can download the aligned reads from the whole genome and exome sequencing and gene expression from the RNA sequencing data.
ATCC's website delivers information about the models is available for purchase. It gives overviews of the HDMI program and emphasizes actual cell culture techniques and information. Each individual model page will give you guidance on the exact complete medium formulations specific to a select model, as well as the subculturing, thawing, and freezing protocols. Prot protocols exist in various formats, including individual documents on each product page, an organoid cell culture guide, and a publication on organoid culture from ATCC R&D scientists. Again, I want to note that from each model product page, you can find a direct link to the HCMI searchable catalog and genomic data's common page. So now I just want to give you an overview of where we are today with the HCMI models. We have launched over 240 models, including 155 organoids. These include various disease stages of disease that come over a variety of tissue types. We are planning to continue to launch more models over the next several months, so stay tuned to get information for future models. And here I want to go into more detail on what ATCC offers in the way of culture support for organoids. The basic protocols used for subculturing, thawing, and freezing are largely constant for most organoid models. They don't really differ from one model to the next, and we offer these protocols on our website. The biggest difference between each model will be the exact media formulations. There are different formulations that cover the current organoid models offered. They all use a base media with standard components, but they differ in that most use conditioned media and different assortments of recombinant proteins and small molecules. On that note, ATCC offers organoid growth kits that supports the formulations. These organoid growth kits consist of small molecules and recombinant proteins that I just mentioned. Packaging them in one kit greatly simplifies preparation of the complete media growth. These kits will be single-use lyophilized aliquots that require no real formula calculations. They're designed to be added directly to the base and conditioned media. The growth kits also alleviate the need to buy and store bulk reagent components from different vendors. Lastly, ATCC uses these same kits in the manufacturing of our own organoid models. On that note, we have an educational video on how to prepare organoid growth media presented by Stefan Friend and James Clinton. Hi, my name is James Clinton. I am a scientist at ATCC. Primary tissue-derived organoids are a three-dimensional in vitro cell culture model that permits the long-term growth of patient-derived human tumors that can be passaged, expanded, and cryopreserved for later use. ATCC is supporting the Human Cancer Models Initiative by making their collection of models, including organoids, available to the research community, and by providing tools, reagents, and training to help scientists utilize these models in their research. This video is intended to help tackle how to prepare organoid culture media utilizing prepackaged kits made by ATCC. These kits, when combined with other reagents, are designed to facilitate the creation of a complete growth formulation for various primary tissue-derived organoids, including those developed from the Human Cancer Models Initiative. Kits should be stored in a non-frost-free freezer at minus 20 degrees centigrade or below prior to use. Remove the kit from storage and transfer it to a biosafety cabinet. Refer to the specific media formulation instructions for any additional reagents you may need and the precise volumes necessary. These reagents should be thawed in advance if needed. Start by preparing any components not provided by the kit, including basal media, buffer agents, glutamine, and other supplements. Because the organoid growth kit components are provided as powders, 
Briefly centrifuge the vials to ensure that the contents of the tubes are not stuck to the walls or caps of the vials. Following the instructions provided, we constitute the individual components in the correct buffer. Typically, this is either in media or DMSO. Mix thoroughly by gently pipetting up and down. Let the vials incubate for 15 minutes at room temperature. Some components may be difficult to reconstitute. To help the material enter solution, incubate the vial in a 37 degree centigrade water bath for 10 to 15 minutes and then briefly vortex. Depending on the media formulation, additional components may be required, such as conditioned media derived from specific cell lines designed to overexpress organoid culture relevant growth factors. After the reconstituted kit components have been incubated for 15 minutes, Add them to the previously supplemented basal media. Add any additional reagents indicated in the media formulation, such as conditioned media. Conditioned media provides a highly active source of some recombinant proteins that can be essential for organoid culture. The final growth media can be vacuum filtered, such as by using a 0.22 micron bottle top vacuum filter. An adhesive sticker is supplied with the kit and can be used to label the final bottle containing the prepared growth media. Once prepared, store the growth media at 4 degrees centigrade and avoid extended light exposure. We do not recommend freezing the complete growth media. This was an overview of ATCC's Organoid Media Growth Kits. For other information on working with organoids, check out the ATCC website for our Organoid Culture Guide, Media Formulations, and a video protocol that guides you through the critical steps to successfully culture primary tissue-derived organoids in your laboratory. This concludes our presentation on HDMI organoid models and culture. To recap, support for these exists in the way of information support on clinical and genomic data via NCI's HDMI searchable catalog and the GDC data portal, all protocols in organoid culture media formulations, growth kits to make organoid culture easier. ATCC offers 248 semi models and will continue to launch new models in the upcoming months. For more information, please check the ATCC website to download the organoid culture guide and feel free to watch the video again at your leisure. And thank you, Dr. Shapiro, for setting up this webinar. We can now go to the Q&A portion of this presentation. Well, thank you, James and Steve, for that excellent presentation. In just a few moments, we'll begin our Q&A session. Please remember to use the chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. The session will be documented along with the uh, recorded webinar presentation on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. So it looks like we've had a, a bunch of questions come in so far. Um, I'm going to start out with a bunch that are specifically around the kits and then maybe move to some that are, are generally around um, organoid uh, culturing. So, um, so for this first question, and uh, either Steve or James can tackle this, um, can the organoid growth kits be used for other organoid models not offered by ATCC? 
Sure, I, I can answer that one. Um, we've only used our kits with our models, and they, our, when we develop the kits, we use the formulations that were very specific for the ACMI models. Again, these are cancer organoids from biopsies. We, so we have not validated them with other, with any other kind of organoid model. So we, we can't really verify that or, or guarantee that. Okay. Um, now this this next question is um, specifically about the conditioned media. Now, can you substitute our spondent or went um, for for the conditioned media? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll I'll speak to that. So, um, there absolutely are protocols that utilize recombinant versions of went for respondent in place of conditioned media. Uh, in our hands, we found that they have a lot less activity. Um, they're not nearly as effective. Um, they're also quite expensive. Um, we haven't tested that extensively with the, the HCMI models and the organoids that, that ATCC has, uh, has, uh, has released. So uh, essentially, you can, but uh, I, I certainly can't promise that it will work. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, all right. Now, this this question is um, relating the tissue type of the, the organoid to the kit. Is, is each kit specific to a specific organoid tissue type? Like, for example, would all of, the, um, all of one kit specifically be good for pancreatic-derived organoids? Yeah, I can answer that. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, we t we tend to have trends where one kit one kit will usually go to one tissue type, but um, that certainly is not abs an absolute. So um, the, the the way these they're so specific to a type of model, and there's so many differences between genetic differences between the models that um, you know, we we specifically say which kit goes to each model on the website. So if you go to a if you look up an organoid model. On our website, it will tell you exactly which kit to use. So you should definitely go by that. And we, and we're soon we're we'll, we're coming out with a flyer that will have a complete list of the organoid models and the specific match specifically which which kit to use. And and with those kits, we have very detailed formulations um, of other components that are needed, like advanced DMIM and so forth. This is a universal uh, base media for all the kits, and you know we tell you the exact protocols to use. Alrighty, I like it. I like it. Uh, so, so what's the volume that a kit makes? The volume of media that the um, organoid kit would make? Uh, each kit makes about two. It makes 250 milliliters of final growth media. All right. Good. Good. Now, um, these next couple questions are kind of technical. I, I guess I'm going to send those uh, to James. Um, one, why does one or more of the kit component vials look empty? And then second, um, I added buffer to the N-acetylcysteine, but it's not dissolving. What's happening, and is this expected? Sure, those are, those are great questions. Um, the, the vast majority of the kit components are supplied uh, lyophilized, so they're in a powder or a film. And so they may not actually be visible in the vial. Um, that's why it's important you reconstitute uh, as, as instructed. Um, that way you'll be able to recover the, the contents of the vial, even if it's not uh, immediately visible. Um, as to the second question about reconstituting the N-acetylcysteine, yep, it's a challenge to do. Um, I suggest heating it in a water bath and, and vortexing it. Uh, it will go into solution um, eventually. But that is that is expected. Uh, it is not. Uh, we are we are aware of that. That that is a a known challenge. Okay. Good. Good. Now, um, I think that this is addressed in the video. But um, are the kits alone sufficient to make the media? And you know, if not, what else is needed? Sure. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, there did, there definitely are components other than the kits. The kits were just meant to be. The, um, the harder aspects of, of components that are used in, in very small amounts, they're hard to, to source in those amounts. Uh, you, you need other things like um, uh, advanced DMM, um, 
the B27 things of that nature, L-glutamine, a couple of common things like that. And then, um, and then of course, most of them require the conditioned media either from the, the respondent or went or both. But, even, but yeah, a few other components and usually uh, conditioned media. Some formulations don't require uh, conditioned media, but most of them do. All right. Good, good. Now, this next question is a bit more general around culturing organoids. Um, how often should you change the media? Uh, yeah, this is pretty much three times a week. The standard is is with normal cell culture, three times a week. You do not have because they because they're in the domes in the the matrigo domes. There's not the there's not a wash step in between each each um each media change. Where you 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 siphon off the media and replace it about three times a week. All right. Now um, this is kind of back to um, the a media question. Um, can can other commercially available medium be used to grow the HCMI organoids, or organoids sorry, that uh, ATCC provides? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a, it's a common question we we get. Yeah, I, I think I sort of stated this in a previous question. Um, yeah, these these formulations. Um, so the question is, can you use other media? And the formulations that we use again are very specific for these individual models, and these models are different from other types of organoids like iPSC-derived organoids are normal because they are cancer models, and they require the very specific components. So we've not tested other other media, other commercially available media other than our own kits in our exact formulations. So so we cannot guarantee, um, we cannot validate or verify or guarantee any other media other than the kits and the components that we specify in our formulations. That that is a good that is a good question. All right, excellent, excellent. Wow, we we have quite a few questions that have come in. Um, so, okay, this this is a good question about just our offerings. Do we have any um, normal non-diseased organoids? Yeah, and unfortunately, we do not. All of our organoid models currently are are cancer or patient-derived cancer. Uh, biopsies from cancer tumors, none normal, and so forth. Um, you know, who knows down the road? We're always looking at getting new ideas for new models, but currently the collection just has the cancer models. Great, great. Um, the, this next question, I guess, is around um, how uh, how are the organoid cultures going to be supplied? Do we send them out as frozen vials, for example? Yes, yes, they're, they're, they're packaged and sent in frozen vials like sort of standard cells. When you receive them, I think this went over this in the in the uh, webinar, and when you receive them and you first plate them, they have to reassemble as organoids, but they are um, basically the, the, the thawing process is more or less the same as a standard cell culture. They're, they're, they're supplied in frozen, it's frozen vials. All right, good, good. Uh, now this this next question is very technical, um, so I'm going to send it James' way. Uh, so James, do you have any tips on freezing down organoids to create cell stocks while maintaining viability? Uh, that's that's a good question. Um, one one issue I would definitely say is that it can be heavily model dependent. Um, I, I think the ability to cryopreserve and recover organoids with high viability um, just varies naturally. Uh, one of the advantages of certainly our organoids is that we have already tested it and, and demonstrated that at least these specific models can uh, can be frozen and thawed uh, with, with reasonable viability. Um, I think it's very similar in a way to working with uh, more traditional cancer cell lines. You want to make sure you have very high viability um, prior to freezing. Um, and then um, I think also uh, one tip I would offer is um, assume you are unfortunately going to lose uh, a lot of material on the thaw. So for organoids, we often put um, several million cells worth of organoids into a single amp in order to ensure you get um, a sufficient number uh, back out. And then also when you're thawing, 
uh, start up your model at a high density. Um, we also have found that that typically can enhance uh, the organoid uh, recovery from thaw and just the organoid uh, kind of formation efficiency um, when, you, when you start it up at, uh, at kind of a, a higher density. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, now, this next question is also very technical um, and could be answered by directing the, um, the, the asker to the uh, organoid uh, culturing video that we have. But, um, James, could you talk about how do you actually make the domes? Is, is there any tick, special tip or technique? Um. <clears throat> Working with uh, the, the ECM, definitely, if you're not familiar with it, uh, can be a little bit of a challenge. It is temperature sensitive. So uh, once you have it in liquid form and you're forming these droplets, you're, you're on, a, on, on a clock. Um, I think my first tip would be to practice, actually, uh, with, with ECM without organoids or cells and just get used to the, um, the, that process of forming those domes and doing it uh, you know, rapidly and consistently. Um, the, uh, as, as Brian alluded, you know, we do have a culture video which kind of demonstrates the process, but just to, to talk about it a little bit, um, create your cell suspension, you know, add it to your, your diluted ECM, uh, keep everything really cold, uh, not frozen, but, but cold, that keeps it in a liquid form. Um, if you have high ambient temperature, uh, if your lab is just hot, um, that can pose an extra challenge. You may want to pre-cool even your pipette tips um, to, to ensure that your, your ECM cell you know, slash organoid solution stays, stays nice and cold. Um, I would generally recommend if you're working in, say, a six-well plate to use a P200 pipette, aspirate up 100 microliters or even 200 microliters of that ECM solution. And then um, when you're dispensing, we... Our protocols uh, talk about dispensing 10 microliter droplets. That is ideal. Um, I think in practice, what you can actually do is basically just sort of eyeball it and using that P200 or P100, um, just dispense you know, the smallest little droplets you can with the goal of getting you know, eight to 10 uh, in a well of a six well plate. Um, whether they're you know, exactly 10 microliters is not as, as critical as um, moving through that process really quickly um, with practice, uh, I think it becomes quite easy. Um, if you want tips for scaling above that, um, we have successfully used, for example, a multi-channel to seed dome, uh, many domes at once. Um, you can set up your ECM organoid solution in a, um, in a little tray and then aspirate up with a multi-well uh, with a, like an eight-channel pipette, and that will allow you to actually very rapidly dispense many domes at once and can also assist with sort of consistency uh, in, dome, in dome sizes. So my, my general recommendation would be to practice. That would be, that would be my number one hit, practice without organoids, um, but it will, it will come with time. And again, look at the, look at the video to, to give you some idea of how it should be done. Great answer, James. Great answer. Okay, um, maybe this next question I can boot over to Steve. Uh, what paperwork is needed for uh, small for-profit companies uh, to source the HCMI organoid model? Um, what paperwork is needed to source, uh, whether you're for-profit or not for-profit, um, it's, it's buying our products is like buying any other products. You, you have to have, you set up the account, uh, go to our website, set up an account. If you do not already have an account, that should be pretty easy. There's a section you can, um, there's a drop-down box you can select from. Um, and when you have an account and so forth and sign an MTA, um, then that's basically the only other thing about, the only other additional step with organoids is you have to sign a hub addendum, a hub agreement that basically just says that you understand that if you're using uh, organoids for a commercial use, there is a license that you have to get from the hub. But regardless, but if you're not if you're not for profit, you still sign it. But it's just it, signing it just simply is an acknowledgement that you understand that you that that license is needed. That 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 is not signing it is not the same as getting a license. Just want to make that clear. It's just an it's just a statement saying you understand 
that you have to take further steps with the hub, it's the Hubert Foundation, um, if you're using it for a commercial use. But as far as buying it is concerned, it's the same as any other any other ATCC product. All right, good, good. Um, the next, this next one I'll send over to James. How long can organoids be subcultured in terms of passage number? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I, I honestly don't know the answer. Um, again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be heavily you know, model dependent, and we certainly haven't taken them out, you know, every single model, taken it out to uh, a point of failure or even if there is a point of failure. Um, we have, I would say, though, routinely taken the vast majority of models out um, 12, 15 passages, something like that. Um, with that said, um, you know, passage number is not really a good way to quantify uh, kind of lifespan of, of, of cultures, and in my opinion, particularly more complex ones. Uh, I strongly recommend that you follow our guidance uh, uh, when it comes to doing cell counts. And, and seeding at uh, fixed densities rather than kind of using split ratios and just tracking uh, passage numbers. Okay. Oh, good. Good answer. Um, all right, Steve. Uh, do the kits individual components um, are they available uh, separately or are they available in quantity from ATCC? Um, are they available separately? The the kit components? No, they're only we. You can only purchase them as a kit. So each individual component is not sold separately. Okay. Um, ah, okay. Here, here's a good question for James. Uh, can we use regular cell culture plates and dishes for organoid culture? Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, because the organoids grow embedded within the um, the ECM dome, they're not in contact with the, the plastic surface, so um, you have a lot of flexibility there. We routinely use um, regular, standard, you know, tissue culture treated plastic-ware in in the lab, six well plates, um, uh, petri dishes, whatever, whatever it might be. So, yep, regular tissue culture plastic that you probably already have in your lab from doing other cell culture will work just fine with uh, with organoid models. All right, good, good. Um, now, this next question has come in. I actually just looked up, and so I'll I'll go ahead and take. It's it's not necessarily an organoids question, but do uh, SW480 cells need to be cultured in Wnt3A condition medium? And uh, the answer to that, uh, according to ATCC's product detail page, is uh, no. The base medium for the cell line is ATCC formulated uh, Leibovitz's L15 medium, uh, which is part number 30-2008. Uh, um, to make the complete medium, uh, you can add fetal bovine serum to a final concentration of 10%. So. Um, no need for condition media uh, for the SW480s. Okay. Um, now, James, once the organoids have formed, how long have you noticed that they stay, quote, unquote, healthy without degradation or collapse? Um, I've, I've said it a lot, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep saying it, unfortunately. You know, it'll, it'll depend on, on the model. Um, None of none of the models we've seen, uh, none of the models that we've kind of released have had an obvious uh, uh, sort of failure point during uh, during culture. So uh, theoretically, they can be, you know, propagated for a very very long time. Uh, again, for any individual model, uh, how long it can go out, I don't know. Um, if you're talking about organoid failure, sort of. During during culture, so in between passaging, but just um, you know you're you're seeing poor viability or the organoids are losing integrity, um, then something has gone wrong. Almost certainly with with the media itself, um, we have maintained models you know again in culture for for easily six plus months. Some of these, um, and you would expect to maintain a level of viability um, that is reasonably high throughout the duration of of that culture. 
Um, if you're looking at your model and you've noticed that the morphology has changed dramatically, if it looks like the organoids are losing integrity, they're becoming sort of like fuzzy, um, if they're falling apart, um, that is probably less to do with something inherent to the model and more to do with um, something about how the, the organoid was handled or grown. Some, something has gone wrong. Um, we do not routinely see that. Um, and and the, in, in part, that's why we've sought to sort of uh, standardize the media and utilize, we utilize uh, the kits also in production because we know, uh, we know it works and it, it, it generates um, uh, supportive media for, for long-term propagation. So without uh, knowing more details about the question, if it's a specific model or something like that, I would say, you know, the answer is a very long time. They should be able to be propagated a very long time, maintain um, good viability. Um, yeah. Okay, good, good. Now, this next question, um, first, they, they need a little bit of clarification um, on, and then, it, then the second part of it's just a direct question. But is the condition media from previous passages of the same type of organoid, or how do you prepare the condition media and store it? Um, I, I, I can answer that. So, so uh, no, when we refer to condition media, we're not referring to uh, media that has been conditioned by, for example, an organoid, uh, either a different organoid or the same organoid. Um, when we refer to conditioned media, we're talking about media from completely separate cell lines that have been engineered uh, to overexpress um, certain growth factors that are um, very supportive for organoid culture. This includes things like Wnt and Arspondin. So, um, so essentially, you're, this is not about collecting media from organoids and then feeding it back to organoids. It's, uh, it's unfortunately a separate, uh, a separate component of the media that needs to be generated. Uh, an earlier question asked whether you, you can substitute these uh, condition medias with recombinant versions. And you know, I, I'll repeat kind of what I said there is you can, but we found it's much less effective. Um, once you've, so, so then, Having generated condition media from these cell lines, and again, there's protocols on our website on, on how to do this, um, how to store it. Um, I suggest storing it at, at four degrees, um, and it has a shelf life of um, several weeks at least. Okay. Great, great. Um, all right. Now, I don't think we tried this, but does the same kit work for um, normal organoids and the corresponding tumor, I guess the, uh, um, the tissue or, or cells derived from the same um, tumors? Yeah, I can take that one. We, we do not have any models, unfortunately, that where we have normal tissue and biopsy tissue from a tumor from the same patient. We don't have any normals at all, like I said previously. So we certainly don't have normal tissue and um, um, we don't have normal organoids and organoids from biopsy tissue from the same patient. Um, and the question is, can you use the kits for, if you did have normal organoids, could you use the kits? And again, um, that goes back to my earlier statement. Uh, we've only used these kits on specifically cancer tumor organoids, so we have not validated the use in normals, um, so that's something that would have to be have to be tried. But we cannot we cannot uh, guarantee that that would work. That the formulations are the same, it would be the same. Gotcha, gotcha. And I guess uh, along the lines of things that we may or may not have tried, uh, James, um, have we ever tried transducing or transfecting um, any of the organoids? And uh, or do you know of any protocol specific to that? Um, we we have uh, done transfection uh, in in organoids. Uh, it's not trivial to do. Um, uh, I we do not have any uh, literature on that. There's nothing on the ATCC website about it. 
um, I would refer them to the, the scientific literature, search on PubMed. Uh, there are definitely examples of uh, various approaches to do uh, to transect organoid cultures, but um, it's not really something that I can I can talk about here. Okay, and uh, let's see. Um, now this next question is another that's sort of um, best probably answered by watching the uh, instructional video that we have available um, on organoid culture. And it's around passaging or expanding the organoids within the domes. Uh, James, do you have any tips or, or anything that maybe you hadn't covered yet? Um, so, is, is it so the the question is about how to extract the organoids from the domes? Sorry, yeah, I didn't I didn't hear the uh, actual question. But, yeah, <laughs> that's fair enough. Fair enough. How do you passage or expand the organoids within the domes? So I guess that would involve extracting the organoids from the dome, right? Right. So uh, um, there's, a, as Brian said, there's a, there's a video that kind of touches on this. We also have a methods publication in, in current protocols in cell biology that tries to uh, go into a lot of detail um, about how to do, uh, among other things, organoid passaging. But yeah, so the act of propagating um, a cancer organoid model involves uh, releasing the developed organoids from that, that dome, that solid, uh, solid or gel ECM, um, mechanically and or enzymatically breaking it up. Um, you can do this in a, in, a, in a tube. Then you want to do washing steps to remove the, uh, the existing ECM. Uh, it helps, again, to keep everything cold because that uh, promotes sort of uh, uh, kind of depolymerizing the ECM back to more of a, more of a liquid instead of a, a solid gel. You do washing steps to uh, remove that ECM, and then you take those broken up fragments of, of organoids, um, maybe they're single cells, and then you seed them back into, into fresh, fresh ECM and repeat this, this doming process. And by, by doing that over time, um, it, you can choose to, for example, expand the culture um, by, you know, as your organoids grow, they get larger, you're breaking them up. Uh, you end up with more more than you started with, so then you can use that to expand a culture. Say, start with you know a couple wells of a six well plate, and you can maybe expand to say a full six well plate. Um, or you can choose to keep the number of organoids sort of fixed and just propagate the culture kind of serially um, in a single set of wells to just maintain the the model over time. But yeah, it's uh, the, the key thing is to extract the the organoids from the domes, uh, the ECM. Uh, mechanically and or enzymatically break them up and then just repeat the process. Uh, and just to dig a little bit deeper into this, um, would you use collagenase to um, break down the ECM? We don't routinely. Um, we rec uh, Again, I would, I would point you towards our protocols for uh, our exact recommended dissociation um, uh, recommended reagents and association protocol, but no, we do not routinely use collagenase to, to break up the ECM. Okay. Um, and um, so speaking of ECM, I've got, I've got two questions for you. One, do we have a matrix to culture the organoids in? And um, have we ever looked at the diffusion capacity of the ECM slash organoids? Um, sure. So we do. Uh, ATCC has a product called uh, Cell Basement Membrane, I believe. Um, Brian or Steve would know the part number. Uh, we mm -hmm. recommend that and have validated that for uh, all of our organoid models, um, and it works. It works very well. Uh, the second question, as to the, sorry, Steve, can you repeat the, the second part of the question, or Brian? <laughs> yeah. Um, sure thing. Um, so. Uh, hold on a second. Actually, I lost my <laughs> bad. Um, okay. Well, I think it was something related to like diffusion within the ECM. Um, right. I think... Right. That, 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 that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, ha have we done anything to uh, measure the 
diffusion capability, or do you have any anecdotal, uh, anything anecdotal to say about that? Yeah, I mean, without without more more detail, it's kind of hard to answer. We certainly haven't uh, calculated anything. Um, definitely, the ECM can uh, interfere with the fusion of, of molecules uh, in and out of these solid domes. Um, but we see this most, this can be an issue when you're doing like staining. Um, uh, you're doing immunofluorescence, things like that, using dyes. Um, in, that, in that sense, the, the ECM can definitely trap or um, kind of prevent, prevent penetration um, into kind of into the dome, into the organoids. Um, but it doesn't really matter for routine culture, certainly. Um, if you're doing endpoint assays, you know, the, you need to sort of experimentally determine whether the presence of the ECM is a problem. Uh, typically what you see when you're, uh, uh, what we do, and, and I think a lot of literature, when you see people doing sort of an, an endpoint of some sort uh, with an organoid culture, you actually, you remove all the ECM um, and just remove it as a variable. So you'll, you'll uh, recover the organoids out of the ECM to do, say, you know, ICC or, um, or even treating with drugs, for example, something like that. You might remove the ECM just to uh, ensure it is not a, is not a factor. So I, I hope that provides some answer to the, the, the question. Sure thing, sure thing. Um, now, James, are there different cell types in the organoid culture? Um, it's gonna, uh, so it will, it will depend on, on the model, certainly. Um, organoid technology, particularly when derived from like iPSCs, so stem cell derived organoids, have, uh, depending on the specific model, the protocol used to generate it, uh, can absolutely have a wide variety of cell types. Um, ideally, they should reflect the, the tissue, um, that you're trying to derive. Cancer organoids, um, it's, it's highly variable. Um, they are certainly primarily epithelial cells. Um, we do see heterogeneity between uh, organoids within a culture and between cultures. Um, what I can't tell you is specifically, you know, what cell types are present, uh, in what proportions, in what models. Um, that level of characterization we, we just have not done. Okay, good, good. Uh... Here, here's an interesting question. Um, James, can you talk about the difference between uh, a soft auger colony assay and organoid? Um, they, they sound very sim uh, similar, the asker says. Um, I can, yeah, I, I, I can sort of see that um, as, as being, uh, as being sort of a, a parallel, I, I think. I, I think ultimately, though, what's different about organoids is that you are um, propagating them in this format long term, and that um, it is more or less their almost their native environment, their native conformation. Whereas soft agar assays, you can put lots of different cell types, uh, cancer cells, um, into it. Um, I will also add another component of this is the media. So organoid technology, you know, um, broadly speaking, is a factor of um, the presence of the ECM and the interactions between the organoids and the ECM, as well as the media factors. Um, so in that respect, I think they're also very, they're very different because you cannot, uh, you will not be using the same media formulations. Uh, uh, they are they're unique to to organoid culture, I would say, to a large extent. But it's a it's a, it's interesting uh, it's an interesting observation, certainly. Sure, sure. Okay. Um. Now, um, do we have any liver organoids um in our website? They asked liver cancer organoids. I don't know if they mean specifically derived from a cancer or not. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, we I, we do have an HMI uh, liver model, at least one um, available on our website for for purchase. Yes, we have um, at least four. Hold on, I'm taking a quick look. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, 
two are from the uh, extrahepatic bile duct. Uh, three of them are from the extrahepatic bile duct. And um, the other is listed as liver, but it's a cholangiocarcinoma. Um, so right. that would right. be very likely from the uh, gallbladder. Um, so we have some from the, the liver area. Correct. Yeah, that's a good point. Is a lot of these, a lot of the models are very specific in certain areas. It depends on what, like with, um, you know, with um, with rectum, we have various locations within it, so it's, it can get kind of specific on what you mean by liver and so forth. Yeah, but that's a very good answer. All right, great. Um, okay, uh, we've got time for two more questions. Um, the first one. Organoids obviously comprise different populations of cells. Does extended subculture cause relative changes in the different subpopulations of the cell? Is that something we've ever looked at? Uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, it gets back to the promise of organoid technology and organoid models that they can sustain the, the heterogeneity uh, of the you know, of the tumor in the model long term. Uh, do we know that that's the case for every single model uh, over, you know, any particular time frame? Unfortunately, we don't. Uh, in fact, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. Um, I think it is certainly uh, something we're interested in looking at. I, I think um, lots of researchers are interested in, in the same question. So uh, I we do not have any direct um, uh, we have not done any direct measurements on that um, yet. Okay. And um, can you cryosection organoids for immunofluorescence or immunohistochemical mm. stain inhibition? Uh, yeah. Um, so organoids behave a lot like uh, tiny tissues. Uh, so anything you can do with uh, small you know, small chunks of tissue you can you can do with organoids. So um, you can do uh, cross section, you can do paraffin embedded sectioning, which is, is more often what, what we've done. But uh, the answer is yes. Excellent, excellent. And and then finally, um, is it possible to provide a uh, customer with a list of the 155 uh, organoid models? Yes, we do. We we have that. We have. <laughs> yes, yes, excellent. yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, um, so we, we can. I'm oh, sorry, as you say, ahead. yeah, we have we have a we have a list of uh, other models on our on our website on the brochure, um, and it's constantly being updated. Yeah, we certainly do. And um, so if you have, you can contact tech support, and they can definitely if you can if it's not on our website if. If you don't go to our website, get you can definitely contact Tech Support, and they can deliver it to you. All right, great. Well, um, at this time, we'll conclude our Q&A session. So um, thank you, uh, James and Steve, uh, for the excellent presentation and, and fielding everyone's questions. Uh, and also, thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. Uh, for more information uh, about our organoid media kits, you can go to www.atcc.org slash organoid kits. And also we have some uh, events coming soon. Um, on October 6th, uh, Kevin Tayo will present his talk on evaluating the differentiation potential of primary airway cells in 3D models. He actually follows up on November 3rd to um, talk about using those models for comparing the toxicological response between um, airway epithelial cells. Uh, and, and then on October 13th, John Folk uh, will be presenting his talk on luciferase reporter cancer lines, uh, which can help facilitate your CAR T development. Uh, finally, in a, a shameless ploy for uh, self promotion, ATCC now has a podcast. Uh, come and join us to listen to season one of ATCC's podcast, Behind the Biology. So thank you again, everyone, for your time today, and have a great day.